This is Winning the Hearts and Minds, Element 3, about how interest groups can affect politicians and public policy. Now, the term interest group should be simple enough to define. Interest refers to a policy goal, and a group is a combination of people. Therefore, an interest group is an organization of people with similar policy goals who enter the political process and try to achieve those goals. Whatever their goals, whether they be outlawing abortion or ensuring the right to one or, or uh, uh, regulating tax loopholes or creating new ones, interest groups pursue them in many different ways. But one important thing to remember here is that even though uh, interest groups and political parties are both considered factions, uh, groups that uh, tend to be divisive in society and argue with other groups, uh, they are very different. Uh, political parties fight through the electoral process. Uh, they run candidates for public office. They deal with policy goals across the board. But interest groups do not run candidates for office. They might throw some money at a candidate and support a specific candidate for office. But American interest groups do not run their own group of candidates, as it, as it occurs in some other countries. So, no serious candidate is ever listed on the ballot as a candidate of the National Rifle Association or Planned Parenthood. And it might be well known that a candidate is actively supported by a particular interest group, but that candidate faces the voters as a Democrat or a Republican or a third-party candidate of some other sort. Another key difference between parties and interest groups is that interest groups are often policy specialists. Parties are generalists. They concentrate on every policy under the sun, but the National Rifle Association is just going to look at gun control all day long, or the right to have a gun all day long. And they're going to watch the government, and if they misstep, they're going to jump in and do something about it. That's what an interest group does. In fact, interest groups on both sides of an issue can be very intense. On the left side of this slide right here, you see an ad from uh, Handgun Control Incorporated, which uh, is from 1988, addressing the issue of handguns and wanting to have more control of them. But on the right side, you also see uh, an ad from uh, Charlton Heston, who was an actor of the time period, advocating for the National Rifle Association, which is all about the right to have a gun. Now, these groups are not concentrating on any other type of policy. They're just concentrating on the issue of gun control, and they are very intense about it. And frankly, that's how most interest groups tend to be. As a matter of fact, there are thousands of single-issue interest groups in America today, this one on this slide, looking to close Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. And there are some types of, I guess you'd call them sub-governments, that go beyond the political power of an interest group. One thing that you need to be aware of as a term in uh, government and politics is that of the Iron Triangle, which usually starts with uh, um, an interest group uh, with a big cause of some sort and a desire to make this happen in a big way. Typically, an Iron Triangle, obviously, has three distinct parts. You have an interest group who is particularly interested in a particular cause, in this case the environment. You have a bureaucratic agency in the executive branch, uh, in this case uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, that might be able to do something about it. And you have a congressional committee that is handling this environmental issue in Congress to make it into law. So you've got someone who really wants to see it happen. You have an agency in the bureaucracy that is willing to enforce it if it ever becomes law. And you have a committee who's willing to make it into a law. That is called the Iron Triangle. And whenever you have an Iron Triangle on any particular issue, the odds are pretty good that it's be going to become uh, policy. For example, this Iron Triangle right here, if you want to pause this and take a look at it for a second, does a really good job showing how these three distinct groups work together in any Iron Triangle situation. If it's an Iron Triangle, there's always going to be an interest group who's going to elect members to Congress and get friendly laws back from Congress. There's always going to be a bureaucracy that is getting special favors from the interest group and fun funding and political support from Congress while also 
uh, helping Congress uh, execute policy choices. And there's always going to be a committee or subcommittee in Congress that is, uh, you know, giving political support to both the interest group and the bureaucracy. That's how it basically works in an iron triangle. This is an iron triangle for the AIDS issue and increased funding for AIDS research. If you want to pause it and just read this through and take a look, you can. Here's an iron triangle regarding um, toba the tobacco issue, interest groups uh, that include the tobacco, lo uh, tobacco lobby, uh, the Department of Agriculture within the executive branch, and the congressional subcommittees uh, regarding agriculture in the House and the Senate. And an iron triangle regarding education. The key thing to remember is that it's always going to involve, an iron triangle is always going to involve an interest group, a bureaucratic agency within the executive branch, and a congressional committee of some sort. One person or one group to promote the issue, that being the interest group. One, person, one group to turn it into law, that being the Congress's or congressional committees and one group to enforce the action once it becomes law, a branch or a specific part or a department in the executive branch. Now, interest groups typically achieve these iron triangles through a process called lobbying, and it's a lot more similar to what you would think it is uh, rather than not. If it says it's lobbying, that means historically it's happened in a lobby. Remember, uh, members of the House of Representatives now have second homes. I mean, they might go back to their home state uh, on vacation time and things like that, but when they're in Washington, they're living in a house or living in a condo or something pretty expensive. Well, in the old days, they usually actually used to stay in hotels, and special interest groups or different interest groups uh, with uh, a particular agenda would sit and wait in the lobby. Now, this is before phones and everything else, so when the politician would come down from his room and head to Congress for the day, this person waiting in the lobby would get in their ear and basically hound them all the way to Congress to side with them on a particular issue. The term became known as lobbying. Now, of course, lobbying is much different today with technology, but there is still some good old-fashioned lobbying that takes place in hallways at political venues and things like that as you try to convince people to vote for your cause. Uh, but again, in a technological age, a lot of lobbying is done through emails, mass mailings, things like that. Lobbying is a classic tactic of an interest group, uh, as is this that you see in this slide here, electioneering. Electioneering is when you just basically stand on a corner and instead of following a politician around through a lobby or into an office or a mass mailing, you just simply stand on a corner and, for lack of a better way of putting it, pester everybody that comes by. It's called electioneering and in some circles it's kind of frowned on. They really don't want you doing it in certain places because they consider it a borderline disturbing of the peace. One of the most significant tactics of an interest group is called a PAC, P-A-C, or a Political Action Committee. Basically, most interest groups have a Political Action Committee, and this is essentially the money spending and lobbying arm of an interest group. If you're in an interest group and you don't feel like bugging a politician, that's fine. You can stay in the office and you can... Uh, do the research and watchdog the government and look at the at the internet and, and stay on this task all the time. But in order to get things done and make things happen, if you're not comfortable with that, your interest group might hire a political action committee or a political or a professional lobbyist to run a political action committee for you. In this particular case, political action committee or Latino political action committee of Sonoma County is meant to uh, account for Latino interests. Realtors, sometimes, in this case, the Illinois Realtors Association, apparently is a special interest group that has its own political action committee. And even pharmacists could have their own political action committee to fight for causes important for them through money and lobbying. The American Psychiatric Association is considered an interest group in America today, and they have their own political action committee. 
uh, that's designed to go around and use money and lobbying and things like that to try to convince congressmen to vote on matters that they find important to them. And frankly, political action committees work to great effectiveness. If you take a look here at the spending in 2012, you have a series of interest groups that used political action committees to get done what they wanted to get done in terms of lawmaking, again, through lobbying, bugging politicians, uh, things like that. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce, Blue Cross Blue, Sh Blue Shield, General Electric, Google, the American Hospital Association. These are all the American Medical Association. These are all interest groups that hired people to form political action committees for them to get things done through money or other methods. If you take a look at some of these campaigns in the early 2000s, you can see the amount of money that is spent by political action committees, most often in a runaway by union-based political action committees, various labor unions that hired political action committees to work for them. You can see once again on this list of uh, the races for governor, the legislature, county and local posts in uh, the New York, or this is in New York, it's the Star Ledger. So in, uh, somewhere in New York State, unions absolutely dominate the spending uh, toward uh, the campaigns of political candidates, because that's what political action committees do. They donate money to campaigns. Therefore, politicians often owe a lot to political action committees, uh, sometimes to the point of being blinded by them and maybe being a little too loyal to them. But if they're not loyal to them, then a lot of times the interest groups will take their money and go somewhere else. If you aren't going to do their cause for them, they'll pay somebody else to do their cause for them instead. So in terms of tactics by interest groups to get done what they want to get done, so far we've addressed lobbying, electioneering, and the use of political action committees to get things done. But there is still uh, one other method that you can do, actually two more. The third method, or fourth method, I'm sorry, uh, as a, that's used as a tactic of an interest group, is litigation. In other words, lawsuits or going through legal means. One of the most common methods is called the amicus curiae uh, stipulation. Amicus curiae means friend of the court. And if there's a major court case, like for example the NRA uh, is uh, hearing about a court case that's going to start uh, determining whether or not guns will be allowed in a certain area, they'll write a long essay to the judge uh, explaining their side of the case. This is totally allowed and it's called the amicus curiae uh, stipulation. Friends of the court, people who aren't actually in the court case but can write the judge uh, with strong opinions about what the judge should decide. This is typically done in the form of a brief as you can see here. It says uh, amicus curiae brief of uh, JEDEX Solid State Technology Association in support of complaint counsel's appeal of initial decision. In other words, they're not in this case, but they're trying to sway the judge to find in favor of the person they want the case to go in favor of. And if that doesn't work, you can always sue. Class action lawsuits are often a significant tactic used by interest groups to get done what they want to get done. Do things my way, or I will sue you for everything that you have. And finally, one thing to remember is that interest groups are also interested in the opinions of the public. Because public opinion ultimately makes its way to policymakers, interest groups carefully cultivate their public image and use public opinion to their advantage when they can. Even the wealthiest and most powerful groups in America appeal to public opinion to help their cause. Uh, for example, the government once instituted a requirement for tax withholding on savings accounts. The American Bankers Association appealed to their customers to protest this, and when they did that, public opinion changed uh, people's minds. So the bottom line here is that if you want, as an interest group, if you want to make change, going to the public and convincing them to vote in public opinion polls and make that change for you is a really good way to go. These are all tactics of interest groups that they'll use. Okay, this entire lesson has been about winning the hearts and minds of the people through various manipulative methods. Don't go using this stuff. Just learn how to recognize it as you go.
Thanks for listening.